Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you for joining us. And uh, before starting the event, I would like to say that uh, uh, actually, we, we like to say, like, thank you from our heart because we are doing too much startup thing and entrepreneurship things, but we don't have always a good example to share. Newspad is an example that we share all the places. Thank you, thank you for that, yeah. And uh, thank you for making us like uh, talking about your startup and it's a great initiative. Man. Right, so let's start. Uh, we will we will share it with the audience before. Uh, so first, I, I just want to say thank you for each and every one uh, for coming. Uh, you know, this place is very unique. It's Actually, the first time I've been here, uh, which is surprising because I know Fayaz very well. My office is right next door. Uh, it's very impressive. It's a very creative space, and I like the the cozy, the homely feeling of being able to come to a place and just collaborate. Right? Most of the places where we go to learn entrepreneurship, there's always sessions and one directional messaging. Um, but this space is very sort of um, you know, it, it almost feels like we should all be standing up and just talking naturally to each other. Um, so, you know, thanks for arranging the event, for taking charge of Startup Brian. It's a great initiative. Mm -hmm. So, let's start the question. And, uh, you know, like you are from a, like you have done the education abroad, and uh, so why you, can you just share uh, your like chatting story? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, first of all, I haven't graduated, uh, so I'm from the school of the dropouts. Um, uh, but I'm in a good club. It turns out that if you're an entrepreneur and you dropped out to start a business, uh, it turns out that um, it's a good thing. Uh, so I was doing a double masters uh, in like triple almost in economics, entrepreneurship, and uh, computer science. And uh, during our, the academia period, there was this business plan competition uh, amongst all the universities in Sweden. Uh, and we happened to think in that one, uh, we came second, and then there was a national one uh, for in, amongst all the uh, universities, specifically run by the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship, which we won. Um, and so that one uh, caused us to drop out. And there was an incubator in the school, uh, school uh, kind of like the way. And we sat in that incubator for one and a half years uh, with our product, which was a was a um, marketplace uh, such as eBay, uh, more in the format of Half.com. Is anyone familiar with Half.com here? So it was a version of Half.com for the Scandinavian market uh, based out of Stockholm. Um, and, you know, I did that for uh, many years. I think I was 19 at the time. We raised some funding. Uh, it was a very sort of a high publicized startup. Uh, you know, we were on the front page of all the different magazines and, and things in Sweden. And if you were to walk down the bus stops in Sweden, our face would be on the bus. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the interesting s the side of the story is that we failed, and it was a very public failure, and uh, everyone knew about it, and I was a CEO, and I was responsible for it, and uh, the stock market also crashed that summer, so we couldn't raise any more money to continue, uh, and so in looking for a new light and new opportunity, uh, I came to Bangladesh and uh, started new story. Uh, the normal scenario like people for us from Bangladesh and all, we actually look after for jobs and we actually do many podcasts and others to get a job actually and in one direction mm -hmm. So I'm like why do this choose and do the like, I mean with great difficult path of entrepreneurship than rather than go for a job and all together. Sure. Uh, that's a very good question and I guess a question that a lot of entrepreneurs uh, generally get. So the, the basis of your question is, uh, is the one, is the assumption that I would question, right? The common denominator uh, that you're basing the question of is, um, how do I make money, right? Do I get a job or do I start a business? 
Uh, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't go into entrepreneurship specifically to make money. If making money is your intention, then the comparable is a job, for example. Uh, but you know, I think there's something fundamentally different about entrepreneurship. Um, and it's this notion of when, when you close your eyes and you think about the world, there are sprinkles of thoughts that go off everywhere. And these ideas pop up based on the information and your experience from before. And sometimes one of those sprinkles is something new. It's something that doesn't exist in the world today. And suddenly when you see that vision more and more clearly, your belief becomes stronger. Um, there, there's this notion of creative confidence, it's called, where sort of your creativity sparks these sprinkles, and as you see them more clearly, you become confident that these ideas that you're clearly seeing in your mind can exist in reality. And so that turns on a feedback loop in your mind, and the more you believe, the more clearly you see them, and the more clearly you see them, the more you believe, and once this biological process starts, your body starts sending out hormones uh, into your bloodstream that activate your muscles, and it leads to action. And you start getting up off your seat, and you try to manifestate those ideas into reality, right? So this process of imagining something, something that doesn't exist in the world, and then creating it in the world uh, is, I think, what drives most people into entrepreneurship because most entrepreneurs are creative people. They want to create a product or a service or put together a group of people or fight for some type of cause, right? And, and I think that's the, the sort of visionary entrepreneurs that I think all of us look up to are more driven by those types of things than driven by, you know, money. And so if your question is why not take a job, then I think if you have that basis as the context, then the decision is very easy. If you want to create something that can change the world, then you don't want to have a job. You want to go and be an entrepreneur. So let's take that to the like history story. So you came back to Bangladesh, and you have not talked to someone of your friends who was going to marry you or something. So can you share the story again? Uh, so I, I came back to Dhaka um, uh, after Halvera, which is that other startup that I spoke about. Uh, so that happened, that failed, I came back. Uh, my parents had moved back a couple of years ago. So I wanted to spend some time with them and I wanted to see what the scene was in Bangladesh from a startup perspective, from you know, a technology perspective. Uh, and at the time, there wasn't much. This was uh, six years ago, maybe. There was a tech community, but there wasn't really a startup community as such, right? Now you have all these great startup uh, initiatives, you have you know, people like yourself and Fayaz uh, pushing this on. Um, but back then you really didn't have uh, any of these things. You had outsourcing companies. Uh, and uh, you had some freelancers, but even then it was limited. Um, so I was here and I was actually doing some outsourcing and I was building some products. And one of my uh, childhood friends, uh, Shafkat, who I've known since I was a baby, he came for his marriage here. So Shafkat was basically getting uh, married to this Nepalese woman uh, who is a twin, uh, and then I ended up marrying Shafkat's other cousin, who is also a twin, and so now we're both married to twins. Um, so, so the day before his marriage, uh, we met at the Radisson Hotel because it was the only window that he could find, obviously because he was you know, busy setting up all of his uh, different onoshans and things like that. Uh, but I pulled him out and I forced him from his uh, wife and all of his duties, and then I pitched him new spread. You know, I said, uh, I know you're getting married tomorrow, but in life, uh, there are certain decisions that we can make that have a disproportionate upside, that can fundamentally change the path where we end up. Because, you know, the small decisions which we take today can make us end up in completely different destinations in five to ten years, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I pissed him, 
the fundamental idea of Newscred. And at the time, Newscred was very different. Uh, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure how many people know what we do, but I'll explain shortly. So, at the time, uh, what was happening was media was going from analog to digital. So the easiest analogy here is music. Music, uh, people around the world used to buy music uh, CDs before. Uh, in Bangladesh, we still do because fine, fine music, or I think they're great on forms, I guess. Uh, but, um, you know, abroad, people, people download uh, uh, things, they download music. And so it took a software company to come into a non-software industry and completely reimagine and reinvent that whole space. So Apple came into the music industry and said, we need to fundamentally reimagine the business model here, right? And so they came up with iTunes, which essentially is this trifecta of features of one license, one business model, one pricing model, and one global distribution platform for music. So this trifecta of features, when we looked at the world, we felt that all other types of media, film, uh, news, high def images, are gonna make the same leap. So we wanted to create an iTunes for all types of content that's outside of music. Because if you could build, if, if building iTunes was a revolutionary thing, then the market for all other types of media is much, much larger. So if we could build an iTunes for all types of content outside of music, then we thought that was a great opportunity to change the world, right? Um, and so that was the first incarnation of, of NewsCred. And as sort of NewsCred has um, evolved over time, uh, what we realized was that, you know, in every large digital economy that ever gets created, you know, whether it's the internet, uh, the web, or it's the mobile uh, space now, or tomorrow if it's Google Glass, that's the next platform, or if every horizontal and vertical interface in the world, all of our walls and all of our floors become interfaces, or if we wear augmented reality glasses and you know the whole world becomes an interface, the truth of the matter is, regardless what the ecosystem is, content is always the heart of that ecosystem, right? Content is always the heart of that ecosystem. So the question that we asked ourselves was, who will be the cable TV of this new world? Which company will every piece of content flow through, right? And then we realized that, okay, the content is great, but you also need tools to massage this content into beautiful experiences on all of these different platforms. You need a content management system. Uh, powered by software and algorithms. Um, and you need it to be strong enough so you know you can create beautiful experiences on Google Glass, but you can also create be uh, beautiful experiences on tablet. And you can also create beautiful experiences on the web and whatever other uh, platform that emerges. You know, When you're on an airplane, there's a screen. When you're in the back of a taxi cab, there's a screen. So how do you create these immersive uh, content experiences in all of these platforms? So then we ended up uh, uh, building our other set of tools uh, for content management. And then finally what happened was um, it turned out that a lot of brands started using our content uh, completely by coincidence, I wouldn't say intentional, um, for marketing purposes. And this whole notion of content marketing exploded. And this wasn't something that we knew beforehand. It really just happened and we happened to be the company that was positioned perfectly with the content, the content management system, and then finally our latest product, which is the content marketing cloud, which is a workflow tool to automate all of your content marketing. Uh, so you can think of it as salesforce.com, we're sort of the iconic, legendary SaaS company that reinvented sales by producing a sales automation tool that was software as a service. How many people know what uh, Salesforce is? Right, so, so Salesforce is basically, when you look at the landscape of companies, you have the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, and then you actually have Salesforce. 
They're also one of the iconic enterprise SaaS innovative companies you know, in the Bay Area. Uh, and they represent the whole software as a service uh, bucket. Uh, them and 37 Signals, which did it for smaller businesses with Basecamp and their other products. Um, so what's, you know, Salesforce basically, when they built their tool, it was completely disruptive. So now almost every sales team in the world uses Salesforce, right? But there are more marketers in the world than salespeople. So if you can automate marketing teams, then you could build a company that's one or two magnitude larger than Salesforce. And Salesforce is a $30 billion company or a $40 billion company. So there's an enormous opportunity here to reinvent marketing with software and content. And that's kind of the route that Newsprint is taking here. So you uh, want to be the like uh, the new aggregator or anything like that. So uh, if we come up with some idea, then we have to do this digital thing for certain any other industry. We always have the fear that uh, if the giant is going to come into the market, we are going to like nowhere. So how do you actually feel of that? So that's a very, that's a very good question, and um, all of you are going to, when you launch your startups, and hopefully each and every one of you will, uh, there will be a giant, and if the giant is not there already, then the giant will enter the market. Um, personally, I, that's the best setup, I believe it's the best configuration of a market that you can have, that there is a giant there. Because number one, it means that there is an enormous market opportunity here. That's the first thing that it means, right? There's, there's, a, there's a big company that's produced products and services for this marketplace and proven that you can get traction in this marketplace and then there's demand for this product, right? So that's a great thing. So you don't have to then do the entrepreneurial work of figuring out this, is there demand for this or not. It means it's a red ocean, right? As opposed to a blue ocean, which is a new market that somebody creates, which is great as well. Google Glass is a blue ocean opportunity. The problem with Google Glass is they now need to create that market and it takes billions of dollars to get consumers to change their behavior and to create a blue ocean. You know, Apple is probably the only company successful that have done that at scale multiple times. So if there's a big player, there's a red ocean, great. There's a big market for this. Number two, if there's a huge player, it probably means that, that a big company you know, when a company gets larger, um, it gets less and less innovative, and it becomes like an elephant, right? It becomes less lean and less agile. And so it gives opportunities for startups to come in and be disrupted, right? So for example, Microsoft, and this is uh, commonly known as the innovator's dilemma. Uh, so do you, are you guys familiar with the innovator's dilemma? So, the, so I'll give you kind of short uh, brief what the innovator's dilemma means. So let's imagine now for a second that um, you know, you're one of the richest persons, uh, people in the world. Your main business is railroads, okay? For 18th century, your main business is railroads and you are therefore the richest person in the world, like J.D. Rockefeller and all these uh, moguls uh, of that time. Now what happens is that Henry Ford invents the car, right? He doesn't invent the car, and there were like hundreds of car companies that invented different parts of the car system, but he uh, uh, commoditized the car like Apple commoditized the personal computer. They didn't invent it. Um, and so, uh, so you now face an innovator's dilemma, which is that should you keep investing in building more railroads or should you spin up a new team to work on this completely new invention called the car? No guarantees, there are no roads that cars can go on, there are no um, you know, gasoline stations where cars can get gasoline. It's a completely new blue ocean. Consumers don't want it, cars are still too expensive. So are you going to invest in cars and alienate all of your current customers or are you going to keep investing in railroads and let the car companies innovate and you take a back step, right? 
So what happened during that time was most of the railroad owners uh, actually decided to keep investing in railroads. So they built railroad infrastructure all over America. And what happened was the majority of them went out of business and Henry Ford became the richest person in the world. So that's a disruptive <coughs> technology and that forces the incumbent monopolies, the Goliath, right, with an innovator's dilemma. But should I innovate or should I stay still? And the same thing happened with Microsoft. If you look at Microsoft now, they're in this awkward position where they put out Windows 8 that had the screen that was tablet friendly that no one understood how to use, <laughs> but it also had this the old legacy. Why? Because they were forced with this innovator's dilemma for many, many years. They saw these touch interfaces come, pushing them, pushing them, pushing them. They were like, no, we're not going to innovate. We're going to stick to the old thing. We're going to stick to the And finally, they were forced into a corner, and they were forced into the decision of, and, and they did it in a haphazard. They slapped on the touch interface on top of the, uh, the, the, the Windows one underneath, and it didn't work out well. Now they backtrack, and 8.1, now it's gone. So I think if, if you can find a market where you're the David and there's a Goliath, then I think that's great for you. Uh, so you actually have changed the business model of the new script to something else. I, I, I guess you have changed the whole product to something new. So uh, when a startup or when an entrepreneur should actually change his product or should he should stick to the original one he's trying to? So how, how this takes? So I would say always. Always. You should change your product every day. And the reason is very simple. The world changes every day. The people in the world change every day. The conditions in the world change every day. The politics in the world change every day. The social norms in the world change every day. So the markets change every day. And the new technologies change every day. So you get new platforms that didn't exist yesterday. And so you need to keep iterating on your product every day. There's no product in the world that is a Mona Lisa, that is completed. Everything is a work in progress forever, right? The only thing that you do not change is your main product. And what is your main product? Your main product is your company. It doesn't matter what your core product is, your main product is your company. Your company, your team is what you're building. Your team has values, it has culture, right? Apple stands for something in the world. Amazon stands for something in the world. Nike stands for something in the world, right? And that company has a set of values and it has a philosophy of doing things and it has an opinion about the world, right? That is your main product. And that product, those core, core values shouldn't change but your products should always iterate with the markets and the demand, right? So that's how I would set up. There's a really good book about this that you guys can read. It's called Into Great. Uh, it's written by Collins. He's uh, written a lot of great books about entrepreneurship and building big companies. Built to Last is one. Good to Great is another one. Uh, so, you know, I think you should, the core product, which is your company, you shouldn't change often. The uh, products, you should keep iterating. Uh, so I guess if you see the news for like a few months ago that uh, you, you scared us today and up to five million dollar in CDC or I guess. So what's the like credit status and how much your current valuation of you can you can share? Uh, so uh, I can't share specific numbers. Uh, valuation was north of. Uh, 100 million, um, and uh, what's that, what was the other part of the question? Like, so what's the like, current status of how many did uh, series you have done? Uh, uh, so this was a series C. Uh, series C, so we did uh, a, a, a angel round, then we did a seed round, and then an A, B, and C round. So I think five, five rounds in total. So actually, uh, this is the part that most of the, our entrepreneurs actually like don't know that what the investor or what he's actually seeing is a series B, C funding and it's like a share of that. Sure. Um, so when you get started with your business, you normally get money from friends and family. 
And that's normally called the love round or the friends and family round or the love money round or whatever uh, you want to call it. Maybe you have some savings and you start your company with your savings. Um, once you've done that, the next step is that um, you want to find a partner who can help you with your business and your strategy to take things forward. Notice that I'm not saying money. I'm not saying uh, uh, can help you with funding or it can help sponsor your business. Um, you know, I think you should reach out for a partner that can help you build a business that has a lot of experience, that's done this before. You have some people in this room like these guys. Uh, that can help you with the mundane tasks of setting up a business or of setting up a strategy, you know, doing market analysis or whatever things there are that uh, you eventually need to do. So then normally you come to a place where uh, you meet these people called angel uh, investors. Angel investors, they operate between your friends and family and venture capitalists. So their job is to fill the gap between institutional fundraising, like venture capital, and uh, your friends and family. Uh, and so the good thing about angel investors is that you get the benefit of them being very casual and friendly, like your friends and family, uh, but then they also have a lot of money. But more importantly, uh, they have a lot of experience. But I think experience is the key thing. You should choose an investor that aligns with your vision, with your product, and can help you and your team move the ball forward. Uh, and then once the angel investor, uh, sort of the angel round is meant for you to prove your product, uh, right? These days it's so cheap to, to launch startups that normally the friends and family round, people expect you to prove your product during that round already. And so when you meet angel investors, normally most companies already have traction. But I would say three to five years ago, uh, the angel round, uh, when we took angel investment, angel round was still primarily for proving your product, to prove product market fit. Uh, so what does that mean, product market fit? Well, it simply means that you prove that there's a bunch of people in the world that are ready to pay for your product, and they are paying for your product, and that you've proven the, bis the basic hypotheses in your business model by making people in the world give you money. So once you've graduated from that stage, then normally you can approach larger venture capital firms. Now, these people are called venture capital firms because when you embark on a journey with a venture capital company or firm, you are embarking on a venture, you know, on a long adventure. At that point, you need to be certain that you want to spend the next 10 to 15 years of your life working on this specific problem and building this company. And most venture capital firms expect that you can prove to them that you can build a minimum $100 million business. Because the way their portfolio works is that, you know, they have 10 companies that they invest in, uh, a couple out of the 10 actually become successful and give them returns on all their investments. Right? And so they expect you to be able to prove that you can build a company of consequence that's in the order of the hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think those are the different stages. Does that make sense? It's confusing, feel free to ask questions. So friends and family, if I have a question, I just want to know how did you go to venture capitalism before before uh, going to venture capitalism? What are the critical steps you have, have taken from uh, day one in development uh, of on new screen to sure? So the first thing I would say is that um, I can't take credit for the fundraising that we raised at, 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 at new screen. I'm responsible for the product and the technologies. Uh, but my co-founder, Shafkat, he did an absolutely amazing job of, of raising all the rounds. In fact, I think he raised all the rounds within one week, uh, all of them. And so uh, the, the key thing, and this is the only thing that you ever need to think about, uh, this is the only thing that you ever, 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 ever need to think about. It's growth. Because if you think about it, uh, it, it sort of makes sense, right? Uh, a venture capitalist wants to put in $1 in a black box and wants to get $10 out or $100 out. 
within a certain time frame. Which means that is that that black box needs to be broken very, very quickly. And rhetorically, there are many questions that people ask about entrepreneurs. How do entrepreneurs succeed? What are the key characteristics? You know, from what I've seen, there are there is essentially no common denominator. Entrepreneurs are short, fat, tall, bald, hair, brown, Chinese, you know, white. Some okay. of them are smart, some are not smart, some are persistent, some are lazy. You know, they're just all over the map, right? Uh, I don't think you can sort of find a key common denominator there. The only common denominator that you can find in all successful companies is that they grow like crazy, right? And which makes everything simpler for entrepreneurs because it doesn't matter if you have a business plan or not. It doesn't matter if you have a pitch deck or not. It doesn't matter really who you are because you can be coached, right? If you are the inventor of Facebook and you're growing like crazy, every large venture capital firm in the world will chase you and want to invest in you because you're growing so quickly. <laughs> Marketing, but yes. Yes. Yeah, so that's a separate question, and that's a very good point, I think, and, it, and it's a good segue because it leads to the real things about fundraising. The real and, and the good news is that the, the real answer to fundraising is the core tenets of entrepreneurship, which is getting to product market fit, getting traction, and getting a lot of people to pay you money and growing your business. That needs to be your core skill. If you can do that, you don't need business plans or decks or anything like that. You know, I think Shafkat, he did most of his decks like the weekend before the pitches, uh, just so that they could see something on the partner meetings. But we were always laser focused on product market fit. How can we build a product? Uh, and I guess you mentioned that part you can do well, but then there's some other parts there. Yeah. You need to uh, market the product. Uh, you potentially need to set up a sales organization to uh, uh, sell the product. And so this is what's interesting, right? You have innovation centers in the world, like you know you had Xerox Park, for example, right? That invented the computer and the mouse, right? So Xerox Park did what you're saying you're good at, which is inventing things and innovating and creating great products. But Apple is known as a company that seemingly invented the personal computer or the mouse, but in fact it was Xerox, Xerox Park. And the reason is because Apple is a product company. What Apple does is Apple innovates, right? What Xerox Park does is that they invent. So there's two different things. They invent real technology. And Apple, they innovate by taking technology that's been invented and they put it together in a certain way, and they package it into a product, and they put it out into these large, large markets. And they know how to market and to get product market fit. So that's a product company. So product companies are normally driven by entrepreneurs who commercialize technology. They know how to take technology, create products, and find large demand for supply of technology. Um, but the good news is that it's not complicated and all the key engineering things that go into making a product, you know, there's a framework, there are things that you work with, there's a similar science on the other side. And so if you just learn that science of marketing and sales in a similar way to the fact that you've learned the science of product and engineering, then you'll be able to do that as well. And it's less complicated than building great products. So you're in a good place. I would say the other way is harder to know how to sell things, but then learn how to build amazing things. So the first thing is team members. Team members is, so going back to my original point, which is I have a slightly different view of entrepreneurship. I believe that every company's core product is the company itself. Your main product is the company itself. What is a company? Uh, so uh, there's this uh, researcher named, this economist named Coase that won the Nobel Prize for uh, his thesis on the company. He showed that forming groups of people 
that are called companies, uh, dramatically reduce the transaction cost of collaborating and building something, than doing it in dispersed different destinations. Uh, and he won the Nobel Prize for that. And we call that a company today. A you company? Coase, uh, C-O-A-S-E. I think it's called the, uh, I forgot the piece of it. You'll, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and all it says is that the transaction costs are much lower if you're in the same location, and you're all vertically integrated uh, together uh, and creating something together on, in a common mission. And so the company, this vehicle we call a company, is just a company of people, right? A team of people, a group of people. So when Faya says, uh, how do you actually put that group of people together, um, I would say initially it's very similar to fundraising. Initially it's friends and family, right? Uh, I would propose friends, but in Bangladesh it's normally friends and family. Um, but getting great people in your personal network to get them excited about your vision. And this is just inspiration. You need to be able to articulate and clearly show those sprinkles of thoughts in your head because that, at that point, they're not in the world. They're just inside of your brain. But you need to paint that picture to other people outside so they can clearly see what you're seeing. Because you're clearly seeing something that's really exciting, right? You're willing to dedicate your life for that cause. So then you want to paint that picture to them and get them excited and join. Once you have some revenue, then you can start more strategically hiring people, right? because now you can afford to pay salaries. So at that point, you can go out and look at who the best people are in your industry, and you should go to all the industry, I would, I would suggest going to all the industry events. So if you're looking for engineers in Bangladesh, you should go to all the engineering events that are ongoing here constantly, the hackathons and all those events, and try to find people who are great engineers and who are entrepreneurial in their nature, right? And the initial group of people, it's really important that your incentives are aligned. So what I mean is that if I own 100% of the company, and I ask you to join my company as my co-founder, but you don't own anything, then it's very hard for you, from your heart, to feel ownership of something that I'm mentioning I'm not mentioning the reward and the money, I'm mentioning something different. The sense of autonomy, right? The sense of purpose. The sense of purpose and autonomy comes from the fact that you can control your own destiny. And so I would encourage that when you build that original team, that you give away a meaningful stake in terms of equity to your co-founders so that your incentives are aligned, right? Because building that original team is like getting married. And when you get married, you don't tell your wife or your husband that, you know, I own 10%, you own 90%. You know, you're, you're in this together now. You're in this together. And so at that point, the incentives need to be aligned. So I think the, key, the, the founding team is normally, for me, the make or break of of uh, the whole initial phase. And the better co-founder that you can find, uh, I think the, the, the much, much higher likelihood that your company can succeed there. The first thing that I would say is the heart needs to be in the right place. Like with anything, in any relationship, when you go into a marriage, for example, it's completely an emotional decision that you make. It's not a rational one. And I would say the founding team should be an emotional decision and not a rational one. The heart needs to be in the right place. They need to believe in the vision and they need to be willing to fight for the cause that you're fighting for, right? It's always better to someone who has heart and the brains. So if they have the heart and the brains, which they also have the experience and the specific and everything, that's obviously the ideal case. And that's what you should be looking for. But I would personally choose the heart over the brain. And there, there are various ways of doing this, but the first step to understanding business models uh, is understanding what are the different types of business models. 
right? So, so in a high level, uh, you know, you have a fixed price. I sell a product for a price. That's one model. Another model is subscription, right? Uh, I pay something every month, uh, but I am a customer every month, right? So most software as a service businesses and Newscript, for example, are subscription businesses. So the first step I would say is um, there are a couple of different models like this that you can explore. And based on whatever product you have um, and whatever the market is, there's normally an interesting opportunity to uh, choose either one or the other. Uh, I can't give you a specific answer because it really depends on the product and the market. So I guess we can just get back on that. We have a quick session and then we can just get back on that. Uh, so we always get back to my questions for the future. Yeah, uh, like uh, normal people, like uh, now people, now these people say that you should actually move this track till then possible. So I have two questions right now. So uh, when should a startup or entrepreneur should look for entrepreneur, uh, look, look for like investor and others? And the second one is that what should be my deck that I'm going to the going to present to the investor? Um, so that's a, another great question. Um, I would say if you can build a, a billion dollar business without ever raising any fundraising, uh, then that is the best thing in the whole wide world. Every entrepreneur in the world will love you. Um, and the world will be a lot better place. Uh, and you know, there are some companies that are examples of this. I'm actually not sure if Microsoft ever raised money uh, because they were bootstrapped for a very long time. Uh, but and the reason I say that is that uh, you raise money out of necessity and out of opportunity. But if you have the means to do it yourself, then by all means, that's obviously the best thing for your team because you keep full ownership over your business and you can build an enormous business. So that's the ideal case that you should strive for, always. That's the ideal case that you should strive for, always. And I fundamentally believe that in five to 10 years, the majority of the startups in the world will operate in this fashion. And the reason is that because the cost of technology is dramatically plummeting. The cost of starting a company is dramatically plummeting. This is why a lot of companies, they don't take series A and B anymore. They take angel money and that gets them to the, where they need to be. Um, and you know, as cloud computing and all these things become more and more affordable, you know, at some point in five, six years, a lot of companies that you will see become large will be without fundraising, right? Uh, but given the state of, of how things are today, and if you, the, the time to raise money is when you want to scale your business. It is not when you want to test your business. It is when you want to scale your business. And this is my personal opinion, uh, and other people have different opinions on this. Uh, the reason I say this is because, there are a couple of reasons. Number one, it's cheap enough to run a company today where you can try to get product market fit without raising external fundraising. You can be a team of two, three people and launch onto a huge market only with your skills, with no money, and you can try to build a business and when you have traction and you've shown that there's a small group of people that want to pay for your product or service, then you can approach an investor to scale your business. Right? The other, the other case is if you need help in, in building your business. So for example, if you're saying, I'm great at building products, but I, or I'm great at building uh, technical solutions, but products and marketing and sales is something I would need help with. I think that's also, I think, a good reason to approach an investor. But for me, that's not fundraising. That's more partnering with someone, right? That's more partnering with someone to help with your business. But if you're 
pure fundraising when you're either getting venture capital or large amounts of angel investment, I would say you come to a state where you've proven product market fit and you and your team are sure that you want to spend the next couple of years of your life solving this problem, then you want to go out and do fundraising. And to your second uh, point is that I think fundraising is something that you should do over time, right? You should get to know investors and people over time so that those relationships over time are built. The way you can do that is going to events like this. Uh, you meet investors um, like Fayaz and other people and you just send them updates about your market, about your company and how things are going so that they can see the growth trajectory over time. So he can feel the growth. Like, wow, six months ago, there were one. Now there are three people, and they didn't have any paying customers. Now he's telling me I have 100 paying customers, and this market is exploding. And boom, he gets another update. Oh, wow, now they have 1,000 paying customers, and they are 10 employees, right? So emotionally, over time, you are demoing the growth trajectory of your company to potential investors. That is better than a deck. But then ultimately you're going to meet new investors and you're going to have to show a deck at some point. Again, in the deck there are standard ways of doing decks that you guys can look up on the internet, but I would keep the deck very short, right? So the things that you really need uh, on the deck is What's the vision, right? What is the vision? What's the problem? What's the solution? Who is solving the problem? Who is the team, right? And then growth. How quickly is the company growing, right? Now, comes the interesting question. If the market for your product is 100 people in the world, it doesn't matter how quickly you're growing, you're going to saturate that market very quickly because only 100 people in the world want to buy your thing. So it doesn't really matter that they're buying your stuff every day. But if you can show that, look, we're growing like this and the market is huge, that's when an investor will be, oh wow, great product, Great team, huge market, and they are growing. But the key of the whole thing is growth. If you can show that you are growing, right? Startup is a vehicle that's meant to find product market fit. And the way you do that is you grow from zero customers to some customers. And then when you've shown that you have some customers, you want to grow and get more customers. And for that, you need more resources so you go out and get fundraising. So growth to me is the key, key point in the deck. In fact, when you start talking to venture capitalists, for example, at Newscred, uh, we have board meetings every six weeks. If we even miss one month of numbers, people go crazy, right? Because it's all about growth and the confidence that you're showing that you're constantly growing. So if you look at the stock market, then what you'll see is that even when companies sometimes beat their expectations, their stock still goes down, right? Because the growth expectation was higher. So ultimately, I think studying the stock market is actually an interesting tool to learn this notion of how psychology and growth works in the world of investment, right? Like, as long as you are growing, and constantly growing faster and faster. So notice that it's not only that you're growing, it's that you are growing faster and faster. So it's an exponential curve, right? The acceleration of your growth is faster and faster. And as long as you can demonstrate that, um, investors will be readily available to invest in your company.